So let's talk about the rule of 13. The rule of 13 is a quick and easy way to come up with a starting place for uh, um, uh, spectroscopic elucidation of structure. Let's imagine that your mass spec has revealed to you that the molecule has a mass of 164 grams per mole. Well, how do we even know where to start? Well, I can give you a maximum possible number of carbons in that molecule if you assume that every carbon on average might come with one hydrogen and maybe more or maybe less but let's just say a carbon and a hydrogen weigh 13. If we divide that number by 13 we're going to get the number of carbon hydrogen pairs plus a remainder. That remainder we could consider to be some more hydrogens. So really all we have to do is ask ourselves what that is. Divide by 13 we'll get a numerator and a denominator uh, and then from those we can determine the formula. Now this rule didn't come out of nowhere. This was actually the work of some hardworking people who were looking for better ways to help teach spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, the first place I can see it being mentioned is in the Journal of Chemical Education back in 1983. So you can go and read the original paper uh, and see that there are that's a valid area of research is chemical education. Now what is the rule? The rule is pretty simple. Divide by 13. All right. So the quotient, which is the first whole number result of your division, is going to be the number of carbon-hydrogen pairs. And then the remainder added to the quotient totals up for your total number of hydrogens. So you know the number of carbons, and we'll know the number of hydrogens. After that, we just see if it makes sense. It shouldn't have a negative degree of unsaturation. Um, and if we have an indication that there's oxygens and nitrogens present, we can swap them out by just substituting that mass in. You can imagine oxygen weighs 16. CH4 weighs 16. We can replace an oxygen with a carbon and four hydrogens. And then you make a list of possible spectra and then quickly move to your, or sorry, a list of possible formulas and then quickly move to your spectra and scratch off a whole bunch of structures that don't fit. And then look closely and see what you got. So here's an example of the rule. There is 164 divided by 13. It turns out that the answer to that is 12 and 8 thirteenths. So the quotient is 12 and the remainder is 8. So 12 carbons and 12 hydrogens plus 8 more. So that's C12H20. Now when we think about that structure, does it make sense? Well, it's got three degrees of saturation, unsaturation, I should say, which means three double bonds, three rings, two double bonds in a ring, who knows, but it's not unreasonable. There's a possibility that there might be an oxygen in this structure. So we can subtract a carbon and four hydrogens and substitute in an oxygen. The same with nitrogen. You can do a CH2 for nitrogen. And if you're getting into a situation where you want to get a carbon back, you could substitute 12 hydrogens for a carbon. Now, every oxygen we add increases the degree of its saturation one notch. Now, if you have four degrees of unsaturation, that's the same degrees of unsaturation as a phenyl ring. Whenever I see four degrees of unsaturation, the first thing I draw is a phenyl ring and then decorate it from there. Keep that in mind. It doesn't always mean there's a phenyl ring, but it's a good indication when you get up to four degrees of unsaturation. So that's what we can do to sort of get a good stab at an initial structure. And then what do you do when you sort of have a series of possible um, uh, empirical formulas is you can go look at the spectra and see if anything stands out. What do I see there? Well, I see some pretty strong peaks just under 1700. I see some peaks over 3000. I wonder. Looks like we've got a carbonyl peak. We also seem to have a very strong peak there just above uh, in the 1200 range and I think that is pretty consistent with a carbon oxygen peak. That could be an ester with a carbon oxygen double bond and a carbon oxygen single bond. Take a quick glance at the NMR and I see the unmistakable indication of aromatic protons and we'll learn how to we'll learn how to spot those when we do NMR. I see a ethyl group, it's just a, the uh, footprint of an ethyl group and I see a methyl group uh, probably attached to a carbonyl. So if we have an aromatic ring and a carbonyl group that's five degrees of unsaturation. So we can go back to the formula that had five degrees of unsaturation and just hypothesize that that's the original formula might not be. So now that we have a possible formula, let's uh, just consider some structures. This is a structure that seems to fit the formula. We have an ethyl group that's 
where the CH2 group is attached to an oxygen. I saw that in the NMR very clearly. We have a methyl group that's attached to a carbonyl. I saw that in the NMR very clearly. And we have two pairs of aromatic protons that are both the same and next to each other. And so basically a para arrangement. I saw the para signal in the NMR clear as day. And once you learn to recognize those signals or those patterns, and you've got the formula, you pretty much can quickly propose the structure. And that's all there is to the rule of 13, and then further using spectra to solve your problems. Once you've got a starting formula, uh, and of course the spectra to help you scratch off other candidates, you can quickly solve problems. And the rule of 13 is just one tool to help you get on your way. So get to work, try lots of examples, and enjoy using the rule of 13.